evening. Glad you could make it tonight. Um, my name is Beth Kazvinsky. I'm the president of the Martin County Master Gardeners uh, for this year. My term is almost up. Um, I'd like to welcome you. We, the Master Gardeners, are um, volunteers under the University of Florida IFAS Extension, and we proudly present these lectures quarterly on issues that are important to sustainability and in keeping with our mission to disseminate environmentally sound, research-based information to the public. Tonight, we're fortunate to have as our speaker, J.P. Gellerman. J.P. is the University of Florida IFAS Extension Director in Martin County, and he has also been recently appointed as the local uh, Sea Grant agent. His focus is on developing environmental excuse me, educational programs with respect to health and well-being of coastal waters and specifically the Indian River Lagoon. JP is a Florida native with a bachelor's degree in political science and criminology and a master's degree in public administration. He's worked for the University of Florida since 2005, earning university tenure and promotion in 2010. During that time, he's worked in multiple programs, including growth management, community development, administration, efficient communities, Sea Grant, and 4-H youth development. JP performs leadership roles for both his local community and the University of Florida IFAS. In addition, he is an alumnus of the 2006 Class 6 <laughs> of the Florida Natural Resources Leadership Institute and is a class one home energy raider. He will be speaking tonight ab about the University of Florida IFAS Extension and Florida Sea Grant Water Ambassador Program. And he will provide insight into what you as citizens can do to, help, to get involved and help your river. We hope you leave here tonight with an increased knowledge about local issues and motivated to help make a difference. Please help welcome J.P. Gellerman. Thank you very much for having me tonight. It's a great honor to come and speak to the Master Gardeners. It always is. And uh, I got to say that this venue is a lot better than our auditorium. It doesn't echo as much. Everybody can hear me. This is great. You know, this is uh, tremendous. And I see a, a, a really a great crowd out here in the audience uh, to hear about what we can do for the Indian River Lagoon and some of the challenges that we face with the lagoon. But before I get started, thank you, Beth, for a great introduction. Uh, I just want to let you guys know that I am a Florida native. I grew up in West Palm Beach, and my dad was a, was a die-hard fisherman. He really loved to fish a lot. Um, and he took me from the age, I, was, I remember catching my first brim maybe when I was four or five years old. So I'd been out on the water quite a bit, and this was his favorite spot to come up here and go uh, trout fishing, catch some snooks, some redfish, jacks, ladyfish, and uh, we would drive two hours. He would get up at four o'clock in the morning, because he loved this. Jensen Beach so much for trout fishing it was the, he called it the trout capital of the world. The fishing was so incredible. And uh, he would get up at four o'clock in the morning, wake me up. This is before I-95 connected. And he had to get off and drive from Jupiter to US-1 and then come all the way up. Some of you folks, the old timers, you, you, you remember that. And that put a lot of extra time on the trip, but it was worth it because the fishing and the nature and the wildlife was so incredible. And we came up here a lot. I have the the basal cells on the side of my face and the scars from all the skin cancer to, to prove it that I was out in the water a lot enjoying the natural resources of the Indian River Lagoon. So I feel very blessed to have seen the river in, in what I perceived as a great state. I remember um, as a child walking out into the water, fit, wade fishing out in the water up to my chest and looking down and seeing my feet, my sneakers, uh, seeing grass floating up on the top of the the, the water in such thick mats it was hard to fish through. I could not, in my mind as a child, understand how people could use jigs in the Indian River because there was so much grass. It would just get caught in your, in your lures and foul your lures constantly. So um, where we are today is a, is a great distance from where I was as a child. So before I get started even farther, I just want to go over what we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to talk about uh, UF IFAS extension a little bit. I think some of you are familiar, but some of you may not be familiar. Uh, issues of the river, why the river and the lagoon is important. What's the importance and the value for that lagoon system? 
what's being done, and finally the Water Ambassadors program. That's a shameless plug by me. It's a program that we put on <laughs> that I'd like to advertise as much as possible because I think it's a really good program. I see some familiar faces out in the audience right now who've gone through the program, and, and um, I hope they enjoyed it as much as I've enjoyed teaching it. So how many of you are familiar with UFIFIS extension? Okay. They said that this works as well, and I'm kind of a walker. I hate being stuck behind the podium, so I'll walk around a little bit. Um, well, UF IFAS Extension is a branch of the University of Florida, okay? So did you guys know we had a university branch in Martin County? It's pretty amazing. It, we're in all 67 counties, actually. So each county has a land-grant University of Florida IFAS Extension to extend the knowledge of the university to the citizens of each county, which is, which is a really a great thing for you. It's a great benefit for you. In Martin County, what we have is the Food and Nutrition Program, which uh, we have right now a staff of three out on Jack James Road, and they go out into our local elementary schools and secondary educations and talk to SNAP-Ed recipients about the proper nutrition, uh, the importance of eating correctly for low-income families. Have any of you had a really uh, busy weekend and you just weren't able to eat right? You didn't get your vegetables, you had to go to a fast food store, You'd eat the old ding-dongs and the, and the potato chips all day. How did, how did it make you feel? Not so great, right? Was it, you didn't have much energy, you didn't think right, right? Now imagine eating like that for five or 10 years. Ooh, you probably feel pretty bad. Now imagine being seven or eight years old and eating like that and going to school all day and trying to focus and learn all the things that you need to learn to be a productive, uh, person in society. So these folks, they do an amazing job. They speak to thousands of kids each and every month on the importance of nutrition, how to eat right. Um, we're actually trying to work with the House of Hope and teaching them how to garden. Some of the master gardeners are going to be teaching those folks on how to garden, adults as well as kids. So they can grow their own produce and they can eat better, they can think better, and they can be more uh, successful in life, which is, a, which is a great program. I'm very proud of Florida Master Gardeners. Anybody heard of that one? Ah, uh, <laughs> this is a tremendous program. We have over 100 vol dedicated volunteers in Martin County, and they do all kinds of different activities from participating in demonstration gardens uh, all around the county to helping people learn how to grow vegetables and demonstration garden. Uh, there's so many things that I am internally thankful for, for their support, your goodwill, inviting me to a great venue like this to talk to you guys about all the great things that we're doing. It's great. Sea uh, Grant. Uh, I'd like to say I am honored to be Martin County's, I wouldn't want to say the first Sea Grant agent, but I'm not. Uh, there was one, I think, back in the 70s. Uh, but from re modern history, I am the first Sea Grant agent, and I'm focused on marine-related educational activities and, and programs. So I'll be working with citizens on how to reduce your stormwater runoff off of each one of your properties, talking to you about the fertilizer ordinance and it's for, uh, how we fertilize impacts the lagoon, as well as marine-related um, fisheries kind of things, working with specialty folks. 4-H, is anybody here 4-H'er? Yeah, I got one 4-H'er, two 4-H'ers, all right. Uh, we have not disappeared off the face of the earth. We're still thriving, growing. Um, 2013, we had 199 kids involved in 4-H, 24 clubs, and now we have over 300. Uh, this is a great uh, program that gets kids dirty, it gets their hands dirty, gets them doing great things, giving back to the community. Last year we had kids going out farmer fields, gleaning, taking excess crops and giving it to uh, the House of Hope and other food banks. So try to teach kids personal responsibility, okay? Um, character counts, and that's what we try to teach kids in 4-H. And finally, commercial horticulture. Um, Yvette Good Deals, your former master gardener, coordinator and now she's our commercial horticulture agent and she goes out to talk to commercial agriculturalists on how to operate more efficiently and effectively. How can they use less fertilizer, garner greater uh, yields off of their crops, market their crops more than they are currently. So I forgot to mention Britton Wilson, where is she? I know she's out here somewhere. She's our master gardener coordinator, I almost forgot. Give her a, a great hand. She just started October 31st. And um, we expect great things, and uh, we're lo really looking forward to the future. And that's the university. It's your gateway to the greater university. So we have the opportunity to expand programs. So if there's something that you're interested in, we can talk to specialists up at the university and bring them down. Uh, we've worked with, we've done programs on succession planning, business management, all kinds of different things. So we're really excited about that. 
So the Indian River Lagoon, everybody wants to learn about the Indian River Lagoon. It's a long lagoon. It stretches from Jupiter all the way up to Titusville. It's 156 miles long and uh, has 2,100 species of plants, 2,200 of animals, and is one of the most, I'm gonna say it's the most diverse uh, ecosystem in the United States. I was told I cannot scientifically say that because it's unprovable, but I'm gonna go out there and say we're number one, all right? We're number one. There's a lot of different plants and animals. It's a beautiful ecosystem. Like I said, when I was a child, it was unbelievable the diversity, the bounty of that system. St. Lucie River and Estuary. St. Lucie River is a tributary to the Greater Indian River Lagoon. Comes out uh, in the Roosevelt Bridge, flows out to the uh, St. Lucie Inlet. The St. Lucie Estuary has been designated an impaired water body since 1998. And I'm guessing if it was in a des uh, designated impaired water body in 98, probably what, like 88, there were some telltale signs that it wasn't in such great shape, right? Seagrass beds are almost non-existent. There's thick layers of muck uh, covering many of the, the deeper portions of the river. Oyster beds have been covered by the muck. Um, and there's water quality targets uh, that have to be met by 2028. So there's a lot of things going on in the negative for the St. Lucie River. Um, and we're going to talk about where these things come from. These are kind of the pictures when I was a kid growing up of what I remember of the St. Lucie uh, River and the Indian River Lagoon. Smiling faces, big fish, good times had by all, and uh, ultimately that's what we want back, right? Nobody wants a green river. Nobody wants a dirty river. I can tell you, nobody wants it. So in the beginning, okay, so in the beginning there was a lot of jungle. For those of you in the audience, who's been here for less than five years? Okay, more than five, more than 10. Okay, now we're starting to thin out the crowd. 20, actually 30, actually 40. <laughs> I've been here my whole life. Um, but it, way back in the day when Florida was first, uh, I wanna say pioneered, it was a wet jungle. It was a crazy place. It was full of uh, swampy areas. Uh, Alligators, I'm not really, a, I was looking at this picture for about 10 minutes this morning while I was putting together this uh, PowerPoint. I can't really tell if these are fish or alligators or birds or what, but um, I think this is a fairly typical take in the day that it wasn't really hard to fill a lot of uh, carriers full of fish and animals to ship up north. I was reading a, a book the other day and they were saying they would fill train cars full of fish. Full of fish and fill a train car, no problem with a seine net. Um, so th this was a bountiful place, it was a wild place. These folks here, can you imagine? I mean, we complain now that when the air conditioner goes off, the power goes off for a couple hours, it's hot, I'm sweating. I mean, these poor folks, they were out there, I mean, when it rains, this is somebody's house right there. So you can imagine how long that's gonna take to drain off? Who here likes to be wet? Nobody likes to have their house a foot deep underwater, right? I can guarantee you that. Uh, the folks in Louisiana recently, they had a situation like that and nobody's happy. So these folks were really tough. I mean, they dealt with mosquitoes and heat and malaria and God only knows what else. I tip my hats to them, okay? But just like anybody else, they were like, you know what? Uh, when this happens, not only does my house get wet, but the first pioneers here, uh, they were car dealers and computer salesmen, right? <laughs> No, what is, what is most pioneers, what are they normally? They're what? Ranchers and uh, farmers, that's right. And you guys are master gardeners. What do, what do ranchers or uh, agriculturalists, what do plants like? Water, right? Do they like to be underneath it for like a month at a time? Probably not. Somebody's tomato crop right there is really suffering, I can guarantee you that. So these folks, um, back in the day, it wasn't too long after this, I mean, I'm talking the 1800s here. These folks, they started figuring out like, hey, you know, if we did, dig a ditch, uh, all that water here runs into that ditch and I can get rid of it. And now I got some really nice fertile soil that grows crops better and I can get more cows on there and I can make more money and, and everybody's happy. And I can drain that land and put more houses on that because nobody wants to build a house in the swamp. Remember that old, that old saying, hey, you want to buy swamp land? I got lots of swamp land for you. Well, these guys, they had swamp land and they drained it and they said, hey, I got nice, nice farmland for you to buy. So that's where we started. There was jungle, water and jungle. 
So when that water, let me just go back a second. When that water, that rainfall comes down and it lands in this area, it runs either east or west, right? For the most part, it either runs to the Atlantic or the Gulf, okay? Depending on what your watershed is. So it baits the question, what is a watershed? Anybody have an idea? I'm asking you guys a lot of questions because I don't want anybody to fall asleep. I keep you on your toes. You know? <laughs> it's the highest point. Any other answers? I'll call on you. I'm not scared. <laughs> Yeah, a watershed is basically uh, water runs to a common source, an outflow or reserve, reservoir or mouth, body, uh, or any point along a stream or channel. So when the rain falls in a certain place, it runs to a common area out to the bay or a river or what have you. So here along the Treasure Coast, we have uh, the Indian River Lagoon has a watershed, and this is basically that watershed. So. The water, any rain that falls within this red line here, for the most part, it's gonna run east into the lagoon. That's our local basin. Up north, they have a kind of a ridge area up here, come down to about Vero Beach, Sebastian area. We lose that ridge and that basin kind of juts out a little bit farther west. So when it rains out here, we got a lot of area that all that water goes east and where does it run into? Right into the lagoon for the most part, right? Because it comes down and it runs right into that lagoon. So. Remember I told you about those folks, nobody likes to be wet. Nobody wants to buy swamp land. They want to buy dry, nice dry land. Well, we ditched a lot of stuff and we drained a lot of stuff for a number of different reasons, for safety, right? For flood protection, for water quality and quantity as well. So we did ditched all these things and uh, this area here runs into Lake Okeechobee and historically uh, Lake Okeechobee would sheet flow over its banks and traverse south very slowly. Um, but with the modern drainage system, it kind of goes to, that, to the Caloosahatchee in rapid succession because it's almost like a, a canal at this point. I mean, it shoots right out there as well as our very own beloved C-44 canal. Uh, and then there's water that also traverses south to the Everglades as well. But so for the most part, our area here, the St. Lucie River and our part of the Indian River Lagoon is highly impacted by the water that falls here as rainfall, because it comes down to Lake Okeechobee, Lake Okeechobee fills up, and the water management district to keep people safe, happy, and dry have to discharge it one way or another, and they don't have a lot of options. It goes east, west, or south. South, there's a lot of farms, there's a lot of people, there's towns, roads, bridges, all kinds of stuff hindering the flow. West takes two-thirds already, so that leaves approximately one-third to go back east, okay? So what happened this year? Um, we had this thing called El Nino that happened. Is anybody familiar with that? Yeah, I'm getting some nodding heads. And it created a lot of rainfall in our dry season. For those of you who are new to Florida, it's fairly dry in the winter time. Like right now, we call it our million dollar uh, winter because it's blue skies, it's fairly warm, people can go play golf, and it's, it's you open your windows and enjoy the outer doors. It's a great time of year. Uh, last year, we had about 500% above average rainfall. And I can tell you, I was over at the fair working with the kids to kind of, because I have the kids come up and clean up a lot of the fair, the 4-H kids. I don't personally, but the 4-H, anyway, it's a, <laughs> it's a long story. But I was over there and uh, we were cleaning up a lot of the fair stuff and it rained and it rained really hard. And you ever have 200 kids in two inches of water and floods and it was not fun. Uh, it was not fun at all. So I can, uh, I can contest to attest to how much it rained in January and February. It was, it was a crazy time of year. Actually, the fair one day was completely rained out too. It was lots of floods and puddles and, and all that kind of good stuff. November through January had the wettest period in record key in modern history. So uh, you got a lot of rain in the driest part of the year. So when you fill up the lake, you fill up your reservoirs, you fill up your drainage basin, it doesn't give you a lot of capacity coming into the wet time of year, right? So you've already filled up everything in the dry sign when you're supposed to be drawing it down to have capacity. Uh-oh, we're in trouble. Things turned really bad, okay? This is, these are pictures from June. I was working with uh, an engineer, we were giving water ambassadors program presentation, and she started showing me some of these pictures um, she was receiving on her cell phone, and uh, I started getting chills down my spine because these pictures here 
uh, are really frightening. This is before it really got bad, before CNN started showing up, before all the elected officials started making uh, visitations to, to all kinds of different areas. This water here, it's great to see nice blue uh, green uh, ocean water, but not when it looks like pea soup. I mean, that's, that's really sad right there. Uh, as you can see here, it's just floating beds of algae. And uh, this poor mullet does not deserve to have algae growing off his pectoral fins. That's, uh, to me, that's unacceptable. I mean, it's, the animal deserves better. We deserve to give him better, for sure. Then things really turn bad. Uh, this is over at Central Marine. There's a little park over there. You can park and walk down a little path. Normally, it's a very nice little walk. I went over there to, because all the pictures started coming out, CNN started coming, there were drones flying over. I was like, I talked to my staff and I'm like, hey, we should go over there and check this out firsthand, see actually what's going on. So we walked over there, um, 4-H agent and program assistant, and we walked and we got right where these folks are here. I grew up here, I'm used to kind of some bad smells in the intercoastal, you know, it's, 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 a part of the, it's part of the atmosphere, it's part of the estuary is to have some kind of stink, stinky stuff. I'm used to it. I got there, and I'll tell you right now, I turned around and, and hightailed it back to the car. It was hellaciously bad. Uh, all three of us ran, and um, it was pretty scary. And I, I don't know if it's related or not, but I didn't feel well the next day. I think I was out sick the next day. All three of us didn't feel well. We all had congestion issues. It was, uh, it was a fairly scary thing, and we never went back. I'll tell you right now, I, <laughs> I avoided it completely. I'm a little shocked that uh, I, would, I have a three-year-old. I would not bring him to that area during his time to see it or not to see it. That was, um, I wouldn't want to expose his little lungs to that. So, so what happened? Does anybody have an idea what happened? How could we take uh, this river? How, what inputs would it take to make a river the size of the St. Lucie River turn green? And that's a freshwater algae on top of it. That's what was shocking to me. That's not a saltwater algae. That's a freshwater algae. It grows in fresh water. How do you turn a whole river like that green? You feed it, right? You guys are master gardeners, I forgot. <laughs> we had excessive water discharge, fresh water discharge. So they were discharging enormous amount of uh, water into the St. Lucie estuary through the C44 canal uh, to draw down the lake before the wet season and the hurricane season really got ramped up. So you had uh, a lot of fresh water discharge coming down the river at the same time. And fresh water by itself in that type of quantity is not good for the marine critters in the river. If you've got fins, you can swim away, right? Oh boy, it doesn't smell good. Just like me and my program assistants and my 4-H agent, we just ran away. Didn't like the smell? All right, we're out of here. But if you can't run away, if you're attached to the ground or you've got a shell instead of fins, what do you do? You hunker down and hope for the best, it goes away. We had a, almost a full year of discharges. There was nothing going away. That's a, that's, a, that's a lot of hunkering down. I don't know about you, but uh, I wouldn't want to hunker down for a year. Nutrients. So the nutrients and all this fresh water, remember, it comes down from all the way from Kissimmee River Valley through the lake, picking up all those nutrients, coming through the lake, coming through our natural, our basin, our, our uh, watershed. It's picking up everything that I put on my yard, all my yard clippings, all your yard clippings. It's getting, picking up all the nutrients off of our parking lots, our roadways. Uh, our rooftops, everything, our grass clippings. I never thought this was as big of a deal until I kind of realized like there's something like 70,000 houses in Martin County alone. Now you can imagine how many are in St. Lucie, how many are in Okeechobee, how many are in Kissimmee and Arcadia and all these other places and all those grass clippings getting blown into river drains. And where does that drain go? What does Nemo say all the time? All drains lead to where? To the ocean, yeah, that's right. This drain is probably going to go to a canal, and all that grass is going to go in the canal. And then ultimately it's going to go out and get shunted and possibly into the C44 and then into the, the estuary. But that, that grass carries with it, master gardeners, what do you, what's in grass? Nitrogen, phosphorus, it gets released, it causes siltation. Remember a couple slides ago I said the St. Lucie is under feet of silt and muck and there's poor water quality. Some of that comes from our very own little farms, those little uh, grass clippings there and other stuff. Water temperatures, the microcystin, um, I guess it, it outcompetes other algaes in warmer water. The other algaes grow, but it grows better than ev everybody else, so it has a natural advantage. I put this picture up there because I think it illustrates 
you know, they say a, a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, this one's worth 10,000 words because uh, you got a hardhead, exotic, invasive catfish, freshwater catfish on the shores of a marine estuary with pea green water behind it. If there is not a better illustration of the St. Lucie River in June of the July and August and September of this year, that's it right there. Um, the algae is bad, but also the invasive exotic species are bad. Uh, there's a lot of bad, unfortunately. So who's to blame? There's a lot of culprits, okay? There's climate change, timing and volume of major weather events. Uh, it rained really hard. I told you a couple slides ago, we had 500%, 476% over the natural uh, rainfall distribution, blah, 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 scientific stuff. Uh, but there was a lot of volume in a short period of time. Um, and that's hard for water managers to negotiate. Because when you're, like I said, full of capacity before hurricane season, and millions of lives, businesses, and residences depend on your decision making, it puts some folks in a really bad spot. It's like Sophie's choice. Do I let the water out and pollute the estuary, or do I hold the water back and hope and pray that a major hurricane, Matthew, <laughs> right, doesn't hit the area and put 14 inches of water into the lake and possibly break the dike and flood out everybody? That's a really, I wouldn't want that decision. I don't know about you guys, but I would not want that decision. So you had major climate change issues, development, who here drove in a car to get here? Yeah. Has a driveway, likes paved surfaces. Because I know, like my car, I have a Camaro, and it loves to go like mud through the mud and the. No, it does not. It likes paved, sweet, you know, parking lots and paved areas. Who here likes to get out at the mall and put their foot out of the door and step right into a puddle? Do you ever? Does it normally puddle up and have a lot of mud in the parking lot of the mall or Home Depot? Or I'm not calling out anybody, but. Uh, big bump. No, it's all nice and fairly dry, even when it rains really hard. Um, so cars um, are not a problem. Well, they are a problem, but they're not a problem unto itself. But the thing is, a lot of things are built specifically for our cars. We have a lot of roadways, and they are pervious or impervious? Impervious. And pervious allows water to percolate through, and impervious doesn't. So if you think about all the roadways around, look at all the roads. They're all impervious. That's a lot of equivalent to a lot of rooftops, right? Parking lots. Look around when next time you go to a major shopping place and look at the size of the parking lot and go, wow, it's all impervious. Okay, none of that water can percolate through and get down to the aquifer. It's all got to get shunted into a reservoir and get ultimately pushed out into the river. Less natural filtration and storage. Um, before we put our houses, before I built my house, well, I didn't build it, but the person that built it before me, there was a vacant lot there. And there was a whole ecosystem that was on that vacant lot. And what did that ecosystem do? I have no idea, but it did something, right? <laughs> it did something. It provided a place for water to percolate down. It filtered some of that water. Uh, it did a lot of things. So when we constantly construct things and remove those, 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 those uh, services that the ecosystem naturally provides, because it's providing something, right? Because before we were here, I showed you those pictures from the 1800s. I can guarantee, I don't have any pictures of water quality back then, but I'm guessing that the water wasn't pea green and there wasn't exotic evasive uh, catfish laying under the bridge, right? It was probably crystal clear water, lots of grass, tons of oysters, and it was beautiful because those ecosystems were providing something. They were providing a service. And we don't historically look at those ecosystems in that sense. It's just unproductive land. It's doing nothing. We need to, what? develop it into something higher and better use. We should start looking at what that use is currently in its natural state, because those ecosystem services are important. Um, eight million folks in the uh, water management district. My friend at the water management district's been working there for many, many years. She said when she started, there were three million people in her district. Now there's eight million. In 15 years, do you think there's gonna be more or less people? If we continue to do the same things we're doing today, for the next 15 years, is the problem going to get smaller or is it going to get bigger? It just seems like logic to me that if you continue on the same track, you're going to get the same results. So we got to do some things uh, differently. More impervious, we got to, there's more impervious surface than there was and greater, greater areas to drain. So we continuously build more area. We put more concrete down, 
more businesses, homes, and that's a good thing economically, but we have to take in consideration that it's a greater area that people want to have dry, they don't want to be wet, and they want to dry that area, and they're going to shunt it into, ultimately, the lagoon. So the lagoon is going to have to have a larger load on it than it has historically and has now. This is a picture, and I apologize, I really need to get an updated picture. This is from 2000, so should be more. The white areas up here are basically your coastal Jensen Beach, Stewart, um, and the white really is your, your development, your concrete, hard surface, impervious areas, and those areas obviously uh, drain into the river. And you can see out here, and you come out to Indian Town, you can see agricultural areas out here, and agriculture has what? Drainage as well. They don't want to go underwater just like I don't want to go underwater, so they drain that land. Here is the C44 canal that runs to Lake Okeechobee out here that uh, a lot of has, is on the front page of a lot of different uh, newspapers and televisions and all kinds of good stuff as the main culprit, but that's all the water in our watershed comes down and hits these little canals and it makes its way to the St. Lucie River and a lot of it goes into this basin right here into the C44 and then out into the out into the river. This is a picture from 1940. See a difference? Uh, there's a lot less development. There's still development in the city of Stewart and Jensen Beach and this area and the coastal area. But out here, it's hard to see it, but it's a lot of highlands. Um, it looks like the water was kind of flowing from north to south. It's probably hitting a lot of little river lets. I practiced that word before I came here because I it was really hard for me to say river, let's, uh, but it was flowing into the uh, St. Lucie River. But when that rain came down, the majority of it percolated down into the ground, right? Because there was nothing there. And or spent a, possibly months, up to a year, uh, kind of just drifting south to the Loxahatchee. You can see the Loxahatchee down here. And I was told that there's some evidence that the Loxahatchee and the South Fork actually connected at one time. Wouldn't that be cool to see that, right? So here, when the rainfall came down, it took a long time to get that water, that rainfall, that storm water, uh, into the river, the St. Lucie River, and then ultimately out into the Atlantic Ocean. In today's picture, um, that is all expedited because we don't want to be wet, and I'm one of those people that don't want to be wet. I'm the first culprit on that. On that. So, so there's multiple issues and multiple uh, partners. Um, the issues, we have Lake Okeechobee discharge, we have agriculture versus urban areas versus environmental issues, we have multiple government agencies, local, state, and now national politics playing a role in policies and uh, programs to improve the river. Everglades restoration, you got water storage for an outcome, you got some people want to improve water quality, some want water qual uh, quantity. I just read a paper in the TC Palm, story in the TC Palm not so long ago, uh, said, I think it was 2050, we're gonna face major water shortages. We're drowning underwater now, and it's, it's mind boggling to me to think we're gonna have water store, uh, shortages, but I think they're on the right, uh, they're right on that one. So partners, there's a lot of different partners, a lot of different programs, a lot of different organizations uh, involved in this, from the water management districts, cities, counties, IFAS. We have a, a regional um, water specialist now and she's trying to coordinate the efforts from Martin County all the way up to Titusville. So I'm doing programs, St. Lucie does programs, Indian River, Sebastian, I mean, we're all doing different programs. We need to get that coordinated and uh, tightened up so we're pulling in the same direction. And that's what I'm trying to illustrate here is a lot of people are pulling in, everybody's passionate about making the river better. We wanna get it back to where it was. It deserves to be that way. A lot of people have different ideas and it's hard to get everybody going in the same direction. So I'm not making excuses, but it's more complicated than just get it done. You know, there's a lot of things to get done. So what's being done and how are we gonna save the lagoon? I love this picture because uh, I told you I went fishing with my dad every, basically every Saturday came up here and I was just a little guy and he was six foot four and he would go way, wading way out in the river and catch all these fish and I was too sh short to follow him so I kind of I kind of played around where these kids are right here and I got to know a lot of the different critters that make their home in the mangroves and came to appreciate those small little things more than probably a lot of other people my age who was seven. Nobody appreciates anything when you're seven, right? <laughs> but I loved my little crabs and I'd play with the, 
the, the finger mullet and fries and all that kind of good stuff. And uh, when I started here, we did a Marine camp. Uh, it was my 4-H um, agent with some kids to help them better understand the value of the Indian River Lagoon. These kids are uh, Boys and Girls Clubs and uh, YMCA kids. This is in 2013. And we really wanted to make a point to get them in the river. And why would I want to get these kids in the river? Anybody have an idea? The what? Make them aware of the problem. A lot of these kids have never seen the river before. A lot of these kids argue with me what a shrimp look like. I remember pulling a shrimp out, and I said, this, this is a shrimp. And he said, no, that, that's not a shrimp. A shrimp is small, and it's brown. And I was like, that's a shrimp from Popeye's. This is a shrimp in a bucket, all right? <laughs> I mean, he literally was like, that thing's a freak show. What is that? I'm like, that's a shrimp, man. That's, I'm telling you, that's a shrimp. These kids, I've never been in the water. They don't understand what that river looks like. And if you're 12 or 13, what is your frame of reference of the Indian River Lagoon? It's a pol that picture. It's a polluted water body that your mom won't let you touch because you're going to get sick. And if you have an open cut, you're going to get a flesh-eating disease, so don't go near it. That's really hard. I mean, when I was a kid, I was in that thing constantly, day and night, and having fun and have all kinds of great memories. And these poor kids... Up here, they have no frame of reference of a healthy ecosystem. They don't know what it is to go out and catch a whole stringer full of trout or, or a redfish or have a great day on the water because this, the river is just in such a bad state. That's kind of sad. That, no, that's not kind of sad. That's really sad, and it really breaks my heart. So what's being done? Um, SERP is the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan. Um, SERP. So basically... For the last hundred so years, uh, we have drained, put drainage canals to keep us dry, to provide water quality and quantity. We asked a group of engineers and said, hey, there's a place called Florida. It's basically really swampy and it rains like 50 inches a year. Can you make it high and dry and suitable for, I don't know, 14 or 15 million people to live there? Oh, yeah, and it's hurricane prone, too. That's a tall order. I'm pretty sure if they said that this, right now, if we go back and they said that this year, they'd be like, that project's gonna be in the trillions, tens of trillions of dollars to do all that. But these folks, they did it, um, they did it like in 1950, you know, and they did a great job. Who here has flood damage from four hurricanes? I didn't either. <laughs> I, I, I'm pretty amazed that they could get all that water off. Remember I told you I was at the fair last February and it was, it was flooded? On my way there, I drive a Camaro, and it's like really low. It's like down here, right? It doesn't do good with deep puddles. I didn't think I was going to make it. I've navigated my way through. I saw cars getting stuck over there by Sam's and uh, Port St. Lucie Boulevard. Uh, I was really kind of really, well, it's like, whoa. I'm, 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 the Camaro might not make it back from this. Um, went, made it to the fair, spent four or five hours there, came back, and you know what? There wasn't a drop of water on US-1. All those cars were towed away. Everything was was dry, there was no puddles. That's pretty amazing. Um, and I am very appreciative of that because nobody wants to be underwater, okay? The unintended consequences is major environmental damage because when you take all that water and you shunt it straight into the lagoon as fast as possible, the estuary can't handle it, the, service, the ecosystem services of the lagoon can't process it, and you have what we had. So this is the current flow. This is the man-made for our benefit. Um, and this was the pre-drainage. So water came into this watershed up here. It came down the Kissimmee River, which was what? A straight ditch, right? It was S-shaped. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that water took a long time, weeks and weeks, to come down. So it had a heavy rain event. It'd take weeks and weeks. It would flood all that, that pasture, that flatland. It's a, it's a floodplain come down to Lake Okeechobee where it would fill up and uh, Lake Okeechobee would basically sheet flow uh, south into the Everglades. So it would overflow its banks and slowly percolate down to the Florida Straits over sometimes years. Okay, so those pictures I sent you back, if you were back there and you had a, a winter like we just hit, had, um, you might be wet for a long time. <laughs> a lot, I hope you got uh, good wading boots on and some and a lot of stored uh, cabbages because you're, you're not going to be farming for a long time. So we changed that flow to expedite the water out east and west and a little bit south. 
And what we want to do is, well, we want to do, the water management districts want to have projects that come in to kind of mirror as much as possible that original flow. So they're going to increase the flow south and keep the flow east and west in extreme events, but increase the flow south and increase storage along the way. Why wouldn't they, why can't we go back to the way it was? Any, any takers? Yeah, there's like houses and businesses and roads and, and, and farms and all kinds of stuff, and I don't really think that's going to be uh, possible. Uh, we can try to restore it as much as possible, but going back to the way it was originally, it's going to be really expensive. It's going to take a long, long time because um, a lot of that stuff is laser leveled. Like I said, there's all kinds of blockages, and it's, it's going to be a rough one. So what's being done? There's all kinds of re reservoirs being uh, projected all over our watershed. Um, and why are we doing that? Because what the thought is, if we can capture in those reservoirs uh, a larger percentage of the rain that falls in our area, that comes off my yard and your yard and, and your yard and his farm and their farm, keep it in those reservoirs, allow the particulate matter and the nutrients to settle out in these huge reservoirs, and you're talking thousands of acre feet of reservoirs, those nutrients, when they do get released more slowly into the estuary, it will be more natural in its, in its flow. So what's an acre foot? Quiz. <laughs> foot of water over an acre. We have a winner. <laughs> There's a macaroon in the back for you. <laughs> yes, it's uh, one acre a foot deep. So when we're talking 3,400, uh, 50,000 acre feet, 50,000, well, it's 25,000 acres a foot, two feet deep, or 50,000 acres, one foot deep. So you start thinking about that, those are pretty, wow, those are big numbers. And you need to have those numbers because of the volume of water that is, has to be drained off of all of our properties, businesses, and roadways. So you can see here, you're talking 741, 100,000, another 50,000. I mean, there's, there's, these are big projects. These aren't like little behind the uh, subdivision um, stormwater retention area. So these things are big. Uh, they're also doing wetland restoration underway. Remember I told you about the ecosystem services? Somebody must have uh, said, hmm, that's not a bad idea. What we're gonna do is we're gonna uh, take some of these, these drained cattle ranges and we're gonna ditch and we're gonna plug up the ditches and let it flood back to where it naturally was. I don't know what those ecosystems were doing back then, but let's see what they got to offer now. And that's what you see there. It's just flooded back the way it was 100 years ago. So uh, it's not a real great place to raise cattle anymore, but it's a great place to percolate and filter water, open space, camping areas, all kinds of recreation. So they're doing a lot of the uh, natural lands um, thing. This is the one I'm really excited about. I call it water farming but we're trying to economize uh, water storage. So in my head, and I'm not an economist, and I'm definitely not an agriculturalist because I pretty much kill everything I try to grow, <laughs> but I'm kind of thinking in my head, if I can get the agriculturalist to earn money and to economize and make a profit from storing water on their property and percolating it through their uh, property, and they're happy because they're getting a, a revenue stream when they normally wouldn't, and I'm happy and you're happy because that water that's uh, getting pulled out of the C44 canal is percolating down into the ground and not running out into the estuary, causing green slime and carrying with it uh, exotic evasive catfish. I think we all win, right? It's like a win-win for everybody. So I'm really excited about this. This is, a, I believe, a citrus farm. They basically uh, um, build a small berm around it. They pump the water on here. They put acre feet of water on top of it. That water sits there and then percolates down through the sandy soils. Um, I believe this one is a really uh, a great um, demonstration because this water, the uh, soils are so sandy. It was a old citrus grove, and citrus likes to grow on, I was going to say mucky, damp soil, but no. <laughs> you guys are right. Uh, sandy soils, that's correct. Well-drained sandy soils. So 20-year commitment. So the federal government and the state of Florida have uh, committed nine billion dollars to the restoration of the Everglades um, in matching funding over 20 years. Does that sound like a lot? 
that sounds like a heck of a lot to me. I don't make that kind of money. You guys are you're like, oh, that's no big deal. You know, I didn't hear anybody, but for me, that's a lot of money. Um, Nine billion dollars, and I do not believe that incorporates um, restoration projects in the river uh, as well. So you're trying to get some demucking stuff out on all these counties and uh, restoration of mangroves and oyster bars and all that kind of stuff. That's on top of that nine billion. So there's a lot of money out there that's going to get spent. 330 billion gallons of fresh water, significantly decreased frequency, so they're gonna to try to keep that water from entering the lagoon up front. So Martin County, uh, there's a variety, of the, your county commission and your engineering department have done a great job. Uh, City of Stewart as well, all of, everybody is really dedicated to maximizing um, or reducing the amount of sediment and nutrients flowing into the lagoon. We're trying to do our part in making that happen. And these are just some of the restoration projects that they're doing. They're taking these stormwater retention areas uh, and re redoing them. I just took a couple snippets of some pictures that I had available, but they're doing really some innovative things. So let me see, this one here is a good example. So the water comes in from the canal and it runs down this weir system. And they do that because the water takes its time and it's gonna circulate around here and it's gonna slow down its velocity and as it slows down its velocity, all the sedimentation and all that silt, remember I told you that was clogging up the, the Roosevelt Bridge and clogging up the uh, oyster bars? As water slows down and it becomes more still, what happens to all that suspended solids? Settles down. So then you can just drain off the couple top uh, six inches or so in, oops. Now I did it, Gellerman, oh boy. I jumped way ahead of myself. Now you guys got to see everything, you know. <laughs> so it, all that solids kind of percolate out and the water's much cleaner and a higher um, and um, in a higher quality than it was beforehand. So this is a this is a, a tremendous um, improvement on historic stormwater treatment areas. Over here, um, what they did was they created a stormwater treatment area very similar to this one, but they have like a um, a recreational component to it. So people can go there, you can go and do a little bit of fishing, you can come over here and have a picnic, you can actually enjoy the outer doors and these retention ponds. I'm a big proponent of retention ponds not being um, rectangular, square uh, things with six foot tall fences around it that says do not enter, you will die and be prosecuted. You guys yeah, seen those? Why do we have those? I mean, you can take that and make it aesthetically pleasing and almost halfway functional as an ecosystem for probably the same cost. So I really congratulate the Martin County Engineering Department for trying to take the lead on that and make something of value for the community as well as producing a uh, environmental positive. So these are, they're working on some pallets, some different planting pallets over here to reduce maintenance as well as to provide additional habitat and ecosystem services. So it's a, I'm a twofer guy. If I do one thing, I like to get two different results. It just economizes things, right? Um, who doesn't? So that's what they're doing here. They're trying to reduce costs, improve the water quality and provide some uh, ecosystem services as well, some environmental benefits. So I congratulate them and I really support those efforts. So the importance of the lagoon. I've talked to you about the history. I've talked to you about some of the, th the issues that are happening with the lagoon. So why is the lagoon important? Why do we care about the lagoon? A lot of you folks have just moved here a year ago, right? You don't have any frame of reference except it was on CNN over the summer. Some of you have been here for a couple of years. How many active people actually visit the lagoon fairly irregularly? Okay, all right, that's good. All right, so you do have a vested interest in the lagoon. For me, my, my vested interest is it's economic, social, and ethical. So economic, as we know, uh, people love to live on the water. Um, county government is funded on property taxes. Uh, this building is funded by property to your property taxes. Thank you very much. I greatly appreciate it. Um, and the great in those properties are of greatest values farther away from the lagoon than they are close, right? That's why Tiger Woods have a big property out in Indian Town and and out there on the, on the grade. Yeah, that's why all the all the rich people they live out in the grade and farther west, in Okeechobee. That's where all the high property values. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
People come down they, they, from New York or Ohio or California or wherever. They want to live on that beautiful river. They want to see the emerald green water. They want to jump in their boat. They want to go catch sailfish. They want to catch snook off their dock. They're really excited about living in beautiful Stewart or Hope Sound or uh, Sewell's Point or what have you. And they pay millions and millions and millions of dollars to have that experience and opportunity. And that's greatly derived by clean, clear water. A uh, productive ecosystem. People buy giant boats, right, to go traverse into Lake Okeechobee? No? Get my 50-foot uh, Viking to go across the state and hang out in Lake Okeechobee? <laughs> yeah, I won't go under the bridge? No. No, they go out in the, on, the, on the lagoon, they go out in the, the ocean, they do all these things because of the, the aesthetic value of the environmental impact. So, um, social. Has anybody seen these stickers? I'm not plugging Salt Life, but there's a lot of people. Uh, Florida Grown, Salt Life. Uh, I saw Lagoon Life. I've seen River Life. I've seen all kinds of things. And to me, this is like a social kind of um, statement saying, I belong to a greater group of people. I identify myself as a fisherman, as a surfer, uh, as an outdoor person. I love to go to the beach. Those are my sub-communities. What's your community? What's your community, man? I'm throwing you on the spot right there. Salt Life works for you. What kind of other communities do you have out there that you identify with? Sailing. Sailing. Yeah. Okay. So those are all like sub-communities associated with, uh, with the lagoon. So it's a, it's a tendons. It's the, it's the tendons that binds us together as a community. There's only a few places. Uh, I'm from West Palm Beach. I grew up there. I don't feel the connection to West Palm that I do to Martin and St. Lucie County and the Indian River Lagoon. I talk to people, I go out, we start talking, and what do we do? We tell stories about what? Our time out in the river. Oh yeah, I remember that time we went into the Roosevelt Bears and caught the big tarpon and the thing jumped, almost jumped in the boat and knocked your... Yeah, we have these great stories to share with each other. So it's a binding force in our community. It's important that we continue that. And it's ethical. That water there, that wasn't a natural thing. Okay, that's because of me, and that's because of you, and that's because of you, and all of us in this room and watching on TV at home. Uh, this green water here, that's our responsibility to clean up. Okay, from Kissimmee all the way down to Sewell's Point, we're all part of the problem, and we all have to be part of the solution. Okay, I teach the kids in 4-H uh, personal responsibility. Be responsible. Responsibility, responsibility, responsibility. Um, and I'm trying to teach that to the citizens of Martin County. Be responsible with your automobile. If it's leaking oil, get it fixed. If you fertilize, take the time to read the label. Make sure that you obey the fertilizer ordinance. We have a blackout period in Martin County that we're not supposed to apply fertilizer for a reason. It's not just because we want to be draconian and uh, interfere in your personal life or get involved in your, in your yard. It's because uh, when that nutrients flows out, it costs a lot of money to get it back out of the water, a lot of money. So it's all for us to kind of make a positive impact on that lagoon. And fixing the lagoon is going to take all of us. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Uh, the, the lady in the front row just talked about septic tanks. Um, we have a lot of impacts on that lagoon. I only have an hour to talk to you guys because I could be here all night. No problem. There's, I'd love to talk about septic tanks for a, a good long while. It is a major problem. Um, there's a lot of different programs to help replace those septic tanks, get people on public sewer, um, but it takes time. It's energy, and um, it's moving forward, and it needs to be done. But fixing a lagoon is going to take all of us because we all live in a house uh, just like these here. And all of the, the guy over here who's cutting his lawn and blowing the, the clippings into the road that are getting washed into the river and out to the lagoon, the guy who's over fertilizing or spraying pesticide everywhere unnecessarily, or the folks that they're scared of Zika, so they're going to spray their yard with uh, uh, pesticide to, to kill the mosquitoes. Does that work, Master Gardeners? No. <laughs> so all of that's running in. The guy who, uh, chained, who's got old paint doesn't know what to do with it, and he pours it in the, in the backyard. Does that happen? Yeah, it happens. 
We have to be more responsible. We have to do things better because at one point, um, we're responsible for the maintenance of all these little farms. We're all little agriculturalists. Everybody in here, who doesn't have a front yard or a yard? Okay, you're not an agriculturalist. <laughs> but I am, I have a yard, I have a lawn. And on that yard, we, what do we do with that, with that crop? We fertilize it, right? And then we harvest it, and then we sell it for, for profit. Who sells their yard clippings for profit? <laughs> we spend a lot of time and energy on that little farm, and really, if you think about it, it's kind of silly because we spend probably more than half of our potable water irrigating it and a bunch of money fertilizing it and even more money clipping it. And if you hire somebody to clip it for you, that's even more money. And it seems kind of crazy when you really think about it, but we have to be more responsible on how we run those little farms. We're asking our agricultural community to become consistently more uh, responsible with their use of pesticides and fertilizer. But who's asking us? Who's asking me? JP, why did you fertilize twice last year? I don't know. I thought I needed it. Well, if that happens 150,000 times across the greater Martin County, St. Lucie, and Indian River, that has a major impact, right? So all these things. So we have to be... We have to be increasingly more diligent and more responsible because there's going to be more and more people coming to our area. The population projections for 2040 is something like 13 million people. So there's more and more people coming, and they're building more and more houses and more and more impervious surfaces. And when you have more and more people, the issue is going to get smaller, right? It's going to get easier to adjust. Yeah, no. <laughs> it's going to get progressively more difficult to manage all of those houses, those cars, those roadways and all the impacts on the lagoon and river system. So another one of our Martin County projects we're gonna talk about a little bit is my Water Ambassadors Program. I'm very proud of it. We're, uh, I was approached about a year and a half ago, well, about a year ago, by the engineering department. They said, hey, uh, we need help educating people about our fertilizer ordinance because we don't have a really good way to enforce it. We have an ordinance, but we don't have a good way to enforce it. So our only option, and our best option, is to educate people, because if people come more educated about the use, how to fertilize, then they're less likely to overdo it, they're less likely to do it incorrectly, and we can make improvements on our estuary and river. I'm like, hey, cool, but can we also do some other things? And they said, tell us about it. I was like, well, I'd like to base it on a, a program I have called the Sustainable Floridians that I did in Sarasota, and it's a University of Florida program where it teaches about the intertwinings of a lot of different aspects of our daily lives, economics, land planning, transportation, agriculture, all of these things have interplay in between each other and impact each other, and it's hard to untangle one thing and not have it impact something else, right? So if you change your transportation plan, that impacts agriculture, because how do you get your products to and from market and blah, 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 I'm not gonna go into it, but uh, it's an interactive six-week course, much like the Master Gardener training. And they're like, okay, we're interested, tell us more. I was like, well, I like to talk to my participants. I don't want to talk at you for an hour. Who wants to do that? You're going to fall asleep on me, right? I need you to talk back. I need to engage you. I need to uh, question you and, and have fun. I want this to be an interactive, fun uh, program. I said, OK, we like it. And I said, like, how about volunteerism as well? And they were really excited about that because there's a lot of different things that we need to get done in Martin County uh, with the ecosystem to help get the word out more and more. And we need volunteers to do that. And they liked that idea. And I'm gonna raise my hand and say I fell flat on my face on that part. <laughs> I thought we did a pretty good job on the, the program and the presentation, but I really didn't, th it caught me all a little off guard on how many people enrolled in the program, how quickly it started to gain traction, and I didn't have the volunteer part put together, and, and I fell down on that. But next year, uh, we're gonna have a great program. We're looking at doing all kinds of cool events and book signings and all kinds of stuff with this group, the Water Ambassadors. So it's partially funded by Martin County Engineering as well as the University of Florida. And we talk about why we're here. Um, this program here is a little snapshot of the overall program, but why, why are we here listening to me and three other people talk to you about the history of Florida drainage and the impacts of the ecosystem and all that good stuff? And these are all topics in the Water Ambassadors course. Um, history of Florida drainage, remember that picture we talked about? We talk about some more of that stuff. Florida uh, FYN nine principles. Is anybody familiar with the nine principles? All right, we got two, three, all right, okay, four, all right, we're green and ground. Um, those are really important to manage that little farm, that little residential farm that we all have. Those nine principles are essential. They're really uh, 
I don't think we're going to replace those anytime soon. So those are really important. Fertilizer ordinance from A to Z. When does it start? When does it stop? How do you fertilize? When you, why do you use a spreader with a projection shield? Uh, how close to the water can you get? How far away? Blah, blah, blah. So we do all that kind of good stuff. Estuary friendly practices. We talk about some of the other things that we do um, besides water. Uh, it's water related, but a lot of we talk about microplastics. Is anybody familiar with microplastics? Okay. That's starting to become a major problem in marine life. They're starting to open up some fish and find tiny little pieces of plastic in them. Yeesh. Um, that's not good. So we start talking about different things you can do to minimize your impact on the lagoon and estuary and what you can ultimately do to make a positive impact. The Water Ambassadors Program, um, I try to get you a lot of correct information. No sugar coating. No pun intended. No pun intended. Uh, I did my best to get your information straight from the source. I went to the Water Management District and got their liaison. I was like, Ms. La Martina, can you please give a, my group a presentation? I don't know how to get it more straighter from the group and organization gathering the data. Um, we get the engineer from the Martin County Engineer Stormwater Division, so she'll give you the straight information right off the, right off the press, so to speak. I'm not trying to go through third parties. I'm not trying to get interpretations. I'm just trying to get you the data so you make your own decision on what to do. Um, provides a platform for action. Like I said, we want to get folks engaged um, and talk to others with similar ideas. So I want to create this little group so we can start talking to one another and start participating, putting together programs, educating our friends, neighbors, uh, and colleagues all across, this, all across the county. I make this joke at the class. I said, I'm creating an army. And uh, I'm not joking anymore. I want to create an army. I want to create an army of enthusiastic people who are have, are armed with knowledge to go out and talk to their friends and family and their church uh, people sitting next to them in church and at the mall. So what they can do and how they can get excited and get more people engaged. And sooner or later, we'll all be educated and we'll all be excited and we'll all be doing the right thing quickly. So and we have to have it. So what do we want to do? The future of the water ambassadors. It's not the WAS. It's the water ambassadors. <laughs> um, development, more volunteer activities. We're going to get a lot more volunteer activities to get you guys engaged with the, with the, with the uh, community. Um, we want to get into the HOAs. Uh, we, last year, I had 11 classes, and we taught 115 people. And I'm, pretty uh, I'm proud of that number, and I'm pretty tired as well. But there's about 150,000 people in Martin County, and that's going to take me uh, the rest of my life to, <laughs> to get to a fraction of the total population. But I'm thinking, if I can get to your homeowners association boards, and Diane and Ms. Lamartine and I can talk to them. Um, they can make macro decisions that impact many thousands of houses really quickly. So help me get to the, an audience with the local homeowner associations. I want to reach out to new audiences through multimedia. We're trying, we have an ad in a local magazine, the Coastal Angler. Uh, we want to get a billboard, radio, uh, all kinds of banners, posters, going to have a display at the fair. We're going, we're going to do everything we can possibly do to get the word out as quickly as possible. So like I said, um, I'm really proud of our output this year. We had a little over 100 people go through the program. Um, I put this together for a professional conference that I gave a talk to when I only had 65, but the percentages remained about the same, that uh, the vast majority enjoyed it. They learned something new. They were talking to their friends and colleagues about sharing the information, which as an educator, that's my goal. That's what I'm trying to do is to get you guys excited and talking to your friends and neighbors and uh, sh spreading the word, so to speak. So, and I did have one water ambassador, and I was very proud of her. Uh, we had a county commission meeting over the summer, and she stood up and she talked to the board of county commissioners and said her piece about why it should, you know, what she thought should be done and how it should be done and all that kind of good stuff. And I greatly, I, I, I patted her on the back three times. She's probably sick of me bringing up the story by now, but I hope all of you guys uh, make your voices known to your elected officials, to your congressmen and state representatives and all that on if you think the water is important, if you think the lagoon is important, if you think future generations is important to have the same things that we had when we were kids, you got to talk to them. You got to make your voice known, okay? So generational. We're coming to the tail end of my presentation for tonight. I hope I went long enough. Um, we have a responsibility to be good stewards, okay? Um, it's pretty sad that when I was a kid, I got to see that river, and it was beautiful. I had great memories of it. And those kids I showed you a picture of before, they don't have those memories. 
And it's really sad, it's really kicking the shins when you think about they don't have the memories, they've never had the experience, but they're getting handed the bill for nine billion bucks, right? Here's your crumped up car that doesn't run, the fenders are falling off and it's, here's a $30,000 repair bill. Enjoy. Is that fair? Nah, that's not fair at all. So we have a, a responsibility to kind of fix some things. Uh, we are barring the lagoon from our children. This little girl, um, you know, she's getting stuck with the bill and she's not getting to in, enjoy the lagoon at all. I was lucky, this is me, this is my pops, this is us every, every day basically uh, from the time I was six or seven till I was 18. So I got a lot of good times, I caught a lot of fish and I really enjoyed the heck out of it. I have a three year old, um, I don't think I'm gonna have those same kind of same memories, I'll have to do something different with them and that's really heartbreaking for me. So, so what can you do? Get engaged with your community. Um, do me a favor, attend the Water Ambassadors, okay? Get engaged, take personal responsibility for your own impacts. So when you go home and the summer's coming and you're thinking about fertilizing, make sure you look at the label. Think twice about putting that pesticide down before you put it down. Do you really need it? Come talk to us. We got tons of master gardeners. We got people every day that come in and it's like, hey, I got a problem with my plant. The master gardeners are amazing that they come up with all these innovative and creative solutions to fix your plant problems without spraying it with some toxic chemical that's going to kill the pests that's on the plant as well as every other insect uh, around in your yard because all those little critters have something to do. And it's not really a good practice to just nuke them all, you know. So, all right, who's ready for a quiz? You know, you can't go to class and not have a quiz. You know, that's not, that's not so. Are you ready? What's an acre foot? All right, all right, all right. What's an STA? Oh, yes. How do you can contact to become a water, who do you contact to become a water ambassador? Hey! <laughs> I give you all 100 and A plus for the evening. Congratulations. <laughs> and I can put that on my report of accomplishment this year that we had two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. 12. We have about 40 people uh, learned something tonight. So there's my contact information. It was my direct pleasure to talk to you tonight. I really appreciate your time and energy. And I hope to see you in a water ambassador's class really shortly. Thank you.